Hello, I'm Jeremy Vine, and this is Panorama. A very British hero. You know, Oz signed up, but he really didn't sign up to get absolutely hammered as he was on that tour. Are we asking too much of our elite bomb disposal teams in Afghanistan? The ID throw there at the moment is, is just off the scale. Even their boss is worried. I'm very concerned my people that have done phenomenally difficult and dangerous work in Afghanistan you know, may, may pay uh, a deeper psychological price. On October the 31st last year, Staff Sergeant Olav Oz Schmidt was killed when the Taliban bomb he was trying to defuse exploded. One of four of our top bomb disposal experts to be killed in Afghanistan in little more than a year. With the bomb squad severely under strength, Oz worked for months on end without a break. Now, in this special authored report for Panorama, his widow asks if the army is failing in its duty of care to that tiny elite band of soldiers who are at the very forefront of the war in Afghanistan. On the 29th of October last year, my husband called me from Afghanistan. He was particularly tired. He'd been up for about four days, he hadn't really slept, and he just said, you know, there just aren't enough others. There aren't enough of us. And um, I do need a break. And it is too, if it's too long for me, then it's pretty much, it's too long for anybody. He'd been out there for over five months and was one of a small and elite band of highly qualified bomb disposal experts. They're the only ones who have the dangerous task of defusing the thousands of homemade bombs or IEDs found in Afghanistan. He basically said it was absolutely relentless and that he, they weren't getting a break at all and that the amount of IDDs that he was doing was just, that it was tasked to do was just overwhelming. I've already been living rough for five weeks in compounds we clear under the Afghan canopy. Staying alive is like a lottery and patrolling the Afghan badlands is playing Russian roulette with your feet. Dealing with bombs is the easy bit. It's the getting shot at whilst doing a job that tends to make me run like hell. Oz believed his role was to preserve life at all costs, and he was proud of how many lives he'd saved. Because he's been in since he was 16, he was 30, um, you can actually see you've got all the different tools that he's done. Um, Northern Ireland, former Yugoslavia, Kosovo, um, his last tour in Afghanistan prior to this one, so it's quite impressive, really. Bless him. See, uh, the mister for my helmet and then a cooling fan for my back as well. All helps in the heat. This is Oz, after he'd passed one of the Army's toughest tests to become a high threat IED operator. Already a paracommando, he was one of the best explosive experts in the world. Oz was an outstanding operator. He'd done, he'd done a lot of devices. He was respected by the battle groups. You know, he, he was the man. What no one had anticipated was the sheer number of IEDs Oz and his colleagues were dealing with in Afghanistan. Our soldiers are three times more likely to be killed by an IED than by gunfire. The threat's massive. When it comes to the physical fighting, the, 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 the actual the firefights and that, we, we, will, we will win every time. We, we've got better equipment, we've got better weapons and our tactics and the way we do stuff is, is uh, better tenfold. Um, so the only way they can possibly try and attack us is with the IED threat and the IED threat over there at the moment is, is just off the scale. You know, it's, um, it's ridiculous how many there are out there. The reality is terrifying. In 2008, the threat from IEDs in Afghanistan grew by 400%. When Oz was on tour in 2009, it rose another 400%. In Helmand alone, 
450 IDs are triggered or are made safe each month. That's 14 every day. He said there still isn't a day that goes by that I don't see an amputee or see people that haven't been involved in, in an explosion and, and suffered horrendous injury. Another operator had come back in that day and that their team had got, been blown up in the morning. One bloke lost his hearing, two blokes got fragged faces and another lad lost both his legs above his knees and one arm. So the morale between the youngsters has definitely taken a hit. It was a big motivation for him. Every device that he could render safe, you know, was potentially one more life, one more limb. Um, so it was very important to him. Of all the British soldiers killed or maimed in Afghanistan, seven out of ten are down to IEDs. And it's not just our soldiers. Last year alone, two and a half thousand Afghan civilians were killed or injured by the homemade bombs. Never before have high threat operators been under so much pressure as they take the long, lonely walk to defuse each IED. It's the long walk, it's the walk you do on your own. No one else goes forward bar, bar the operator. As you head towards the device, you're thinking about the bomb maker himself and you're thinking about the device itself because those two things will establish effectively whether you live or die at the end of the day. It's the humidity combined with that searing heat which can reach up to uh, 55, 60 degrees. You constantly have sweat pouring off your face. You have dust, you know, a layer of dust on you at all times. The biggest pressure you're under is actually time, because there are potentially people's lives relying on it. And there's an added threat. They're targeted by Taliban snipers while they work. You can't think about the enemy rounds coming in or anything. You've got to rely on the infantry that are with you to protect you and look after you so you can do your job and work on the device. A, a heavy day would be something in the order of about 12 to 15 in a day. Over probably three, three, four days, we cleared probably 30, 37 devices. We all intrinsically understand the, the dangerous nature of the job, but you just get on with it. Um, but then when a close friend of yours gets killed, that's a bit of a, a bookmark. It's a bit of a reminder that actually the job that you are doing could potentially take your life. In making this programme, I hope to discover more about how Oz died and the pressures he was working under. The Army's most senior bomb disposal officer agreed to meet me. These are photographs taken by uh, one of Olaf's team members after he completed a series of actions. So he's in what we call sort of the clear-up clear -up phase of this operation. And, and these are the last photographs uh, uh, that we have of, of your, your husband alive. Uh, these were taken you know, approximately 15 minutes before uh, the, uh, the blast in which he was killed, killed in action. These are very precious and thank you for letting me have these. This was the third uh, IED incident that uh, uh, Olaf was tasked to on the 31st of October. This area of Sangin is, uh, is very, very heavily seeded with IEDs. There are literally IEDs almost everywhere. They're, they're really upsetting, but it's, for me, it's very important to actually see what he was doing and find out exactly the last moments before he died. And here he's actually working on the ground. It's, the light here looks really good, but actually he's in quite a lot of shadow. I mean, was he under a lot of pressure that day? I mean, it's getting fairly late in the day, and if he had more jobs to go to, would he be working at quite a high tempo and quite... A, would he be pushing himself, basically, to get these done, is what I'm saying. It is a very hazardous area. The fact that it is now getting quite late in the afternoon would, would be a cause for concern here, because the operators are very, very keen to, uh, to not work during the hours of, uh, of darkness. So, basically, you're saying to me that we, we need more operators, we need more high-threat teams. I think we could certainly use more high-threat uh, IEDD operators in, in Afghanistan. 
Whilst making this program, I discovered a reason why there's a shortage. It rests with senior officers who in 2002 suspended the recruitment of high threat IED operators for 18 months. The MOD's own figures show that by 2008, bomb disposal experts were 40% under strength. This is a time when the Taliban were planting more and more IEDs. The MOD told us the decision to halt training was based on current requirement and anticipated future requirement. In September 2008, Warrant Officer Gary O'Donnell was killed defusing a bomb. He was a friend of Oz and the first of four high threat operators to die so far in Afghanistan. That really did hit him hard, actually. And he had one weekend off after that and he didn't go out at all, didn't open the curtains. And he was very upset and unsettled. Gary O'Donnell's death shocked the tight-knit bomb disposal community. Several high threat team members, including close friends of Oz, left adding to the shortage. It was an accumulation of things, really, why I left. Um, the main one was uh, carrying a friend with Oz off, off a plane in, in, in a coffin, which is just a massive reality check, you know? I mean, we've not lost... After O'Donnell's death, the pressure on the remaining operators intensified. They were fewer in number, yet they were dealing with more and more bombs. I remember doing like um, Northern Ireland where we used to do like six month tours, mm -hmm. but we'd actually not get an IED every day. Where these guys now that are operating in uh, in, in, in Afghan, they're, they're getting up to, they can get as many as five to ten devices a day. And that's got to take your toll on you. Mm. Where now, I think four months is a long time for what they're doing out there. And six months is just... It is, isn't it? Without these creature comforts, to just kind of <clears throat> recharge a little bit and just step back. Absolutely. It does take a, a massive emotional drain on, on these guys out there. Mm. You know, but, and to anyone to think any different, it's quite naive of them, really, to think that. But, I mean, you must have heard the, the, the difference in Oz's character. Yes, from, I did. Yes, it's stresses and strain. It was clear from his calls and letters home that as time went on, even Oz was struggling with a relentless workload. His willpower was coming and going, and he was flaking at that point, saying, I do need a break from this, I need to, I need to step back, because I need to recharge. And I don't feel that he necessarily had that time. You know, he was creaking at that point, the little cracks were showing. See those steps, it's just up yeah. on top of those steps, it is me. The Army has now increased the number of bomb disposal experts it trains, but it's not at full strength. To get to Aussie's level takes up to seven years. These trainees are having their skills tested for the first time. They've got to be able to uh, think for themselves, analyse situations, read the ground, they've got to be technically astute, they've got to have a good knowledge of explosives, a good no knowledge of electronics. They're going to be very clever, really, uh, and that's what we look for in, in our operators. We need to get maximum velocity, bearing in mind that kinetic energy equals half mv squared, v squared being the dominant process in that equation, so the higher the velocity... Trainees who pass learn to defuse bombs in the most demanding environments. It's mentally and physically gruelling. Less than half will pass the final test. You can only train so many. And, and we train to the best of our ability. We produce the best operators available. It's the best bomb disposal training, if you like, in the world. Um, are there enough around? We could always use more, but these people don't grow overnight, you know? These people take time to, to build. You can't buy experience and you can't buy quality. Fire it now! And this is the sort of warfare they're preparing for. Operation Panther's Claw. Its mission to clear an area of Helmand that was a stronghold of Taliban bomb makers. They responded by planting thousands of IEDs. Oz was on the front line. It was a lethal summer. The shortage of troops meant there were too few soldiers to hold captured ground. Time and time again, he did speak of where he cleared areas. Um, and then because they couldn't secure it, Taliban would come back in and then clearly put those devices back in, but try and up the game even. It's almost sort of like 
you know, one step forward, two steps back. So the support clearly wasn't there. Experts like Oz became the target. It is like fighting an enemy that you can't see. You know, it's, you, you know, every, everywhere you go, you need to be aware 100%. You, couldn't, you can't switch off for two, for, you know, for, for two minutes. When you're dealing with a task, you're most likely being watched. They're watching what you're doing, how you're responding, and looking for ways to target you in the future. Psychologically, you just got to get on with it. You know, it's just, um, it's our job. Last summer, Captain Daniel Shepherd was diffusing IEDs to clear a vital supply route. We've got some very good sort of intelligence on the way we conduct our business. They watch us closely to try and find ways of catching us out in future. Uh, and it's a case that we have to be aware of every action that we take. On July the 20th, Dan Shepard became the second high threat operator to die in Afghanistan. Oz took it badly. When Dan Shepard died, he was in bits and he said, why me and not him, you know? And he felt this almost guilt, you know, this couldn't kind of work it out in his own head, you know? He just said it's like a Russian roulette really, isn't it? And the odds then became, he said, it's it's getting, now I see it's 50-50. I either live or I die when I do a, a device. In March, I travelled to meet Dan's family for the first time. I'm not nervous about meeting them. It's just quite emotional, really, because you've both suffered a loss. It is, this is Hi. David, my husband. Hi. Lovely to meet you. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. And this is Paul, my son. Hiya, Paul. All right. Yeah. yeah, nice to meet you. Okay, okay. Yeah, good, not too bad. Mm. The searing heat in Afghanistan meant Oz and Dan worked without protective bomb suits despite the huge number of IEDs. If you listen to the numbers are being quoted, I, I know Daniel and Oz doing 10, 15 in a day. Yeah, yep. Mm. Um, Daniel was really suffering with the heat, but... Um, and that's why they can't necessarily wear a bomb suit. Absolutely. I think some people yeah, think, well, I why mean, is he not... I'm sure you've gone My friends and family said, well, why is he not wearing mm. a bomb suit? Yeah. It's actually... Tell me yeah. to try and put one on. Yeah. 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 Weigh a ton. And then work maybe for eight to ten hours yeah. in that yeah. suit, can't plus a day. Couldn't do it. Yeah. But he, he, he was also confident, I would say. He, he, you know, nothing was going to happen to Dan. He was coming home. And... Um, I think that confidence wore off on uh, Paul and myself. But yep. um, his mother Judy, she she worried daily about the fact that um, she wants a confident as what we were. Mm -hmm. mm. After Dan's death, Oz wrote a letter for his family. It's certainly been a great comfort to us uh, receiving this letter. It's been uh, really nice. Certainly was held in our regard, yeah. I like the piece, can I? I think it's important to let you know that this, he will never be forgotten. As, a, as I'm sure you're aware, it's been an unforgiving summer and unfortunately Dan paid the ultimate price. Oz said, um, I'm currently operating where Dan passed and there was not one man in his battle group that didn't know him and his work here was exceptional, saving lives daily in the harshest of conditions because I think at that point it was about 48, 50 degree heat. Mm. Mm. In August, Oz worked with the two rifles battle group to clear Pharmacy Road, a key supply route. It was an extremely dangerous operation Two booby-trapped vehicles blocked the road and the narrow alleyways around were littered with IEDs. The heat was particularly tough, I think, quite gruelling. I know he's tired because I can. Do, you just know when you know somebody and you can just see it, see it in his face. In just 24 hours, Oz cleared 31 bombs, often by fingertip search. Pharmacy Road was reopened. 
And even now, it's just they're just really, really hard to look at, really hard to look at. But there was no let up for Oz. He went from one task to another. Also, the lack of helicopters and poorly equipped vehicles made his job more difficult and dangerous. While most soldiers would return for breaks to Bastion, the main camp, Oz didn't. He just felt that he didn't have that regu those regular breaks and there wasn't anybody there kind of letting him off the hook. There was nobody there thinking bigger picture. Colonel Stuart Tootle commanded three power regiment during some of the fiercest fighting in Helmand. He resigned from the army in 2007 after voicing concerns about the welfare of his soldiers. Soldiers like Oz will, will push themselves and will keep going out and keep stepping on the plate because that's what British soldiers do. What's the danger if they don't get those breaks? What could happen? On the one hand, they'll become increasingly more tired and so consequently they won't be as fresh as they were at the start of an operation. Their performance could degrade, uh, they'll be less alert and they might miss things. And so that's why risk increases. And that means that that needs to be monitored in such a way that as troops become more tired, that they are given a break. Now often that break may only be back in Camp Bastion, but again, two or three days back in Camp Bastion makes the world a difference to someone who's been in the line doing these high-risk tasks for several weeks. The Army has guidelines about rest breaks and length of tours, but admits they've been broken at times. They told us they are now taking steps to address the situation. I question whether the Ministry of Defence is fulfilling its duty of care to soldiers like Oz. Its own research shows that fewer breaks leave soldiers more susceptible to combat stress and PTSD. Even the Army's most senior bomb disposal officer is worried. I'm very concerned uh, that, you know, in the longer term, you know, some of my, uh, my, my people that have done phenomenally difficult and dangerous work in Afghanistan, you know, may, may pay uh, a deeper psychological price uh, for the work that they've conducted. We're about to kick off a, a more detailed study looking at the psych psychological impacts of these operations because we've got a duty of care. You know, we owe it to, to, to these people to do the best we can. By late October, Oz had still not had a rest break. He'd diffused hundreds of IEDs. 72 hours before he was due to come home, he called me. He was particularly tired. He'd been up for about four days, he hadn't really slept. He just said, you know, I can't wait for Saturday. When I get off that plane, I just, you are definitely gonna pick us up, aren't you? That's all I wanna see is just you. When I get off that plane, that is all I want. That's the only thing that I've got in my mind. I had a bad feeling after that call. It was the last time I ever heard his voice. I heard the knock on the door that is directly below the window of, of, of my bedroom and uh, looked down and saw, and, and saw two um, guys in green kit with um, green lids. I said, oh, God, no, you know, God. And um, that's when I knew, I absolutely physically knew for sure that he was dead. I just can't... I just I can't get past that, literally at the 11th hour, at the very last job. I really thought we were home free. Instead of celebrating his safe return, I was in Wooden Bassett, keeping a promise I'd made to my husband. I remember having the conversation with Oz when he phoned me up really late at night after it and said, you know, you better be there when I'm there. And he said, I hope that, I don't, I don't want my wife standing there, um, you know, in bits on the floor. I want you to be absolutely proud of me and know, you know, how hard I've worked and I want you to be able to stand there and be appreciative and, and show your love for me and be as positive as you can about what I've achieved and what I've done. 
Oz lived and stood for something he believed in. And in the end, he paid the ultimate sacrifice for those beliefs. The high threat IED operators are few in number, but are of vital importance in Afghanistan, where IEDs are the first line of attack. Last October, Oz's close friend, Captain Daniel Reed was injured in a bomb blast which killed a member of his team. In spite of those injuries, he rejoined his team in December. In January, Dan was killed defusing a device. He was the fourth elite bomb disposal expert to die within 15 months. A fifth survived, but had both legs blown off. While I've been making this program, a senior military officer has told us that at the start of the war in Afghanistan, only limited consideration was given to the threat of IEDs. He said they were not thought to be an immediate problem. The MOD told us it could not reasonably have been expected to predict the surge in the use of IEDs. You know, Oz signed up, but he really didn't sign up to get absolutely hammered as he was on that tour and not get his R&R &R on time. And I feel slightly shortchanged because he signed up, but he didn't sign up for that, and I didn't. I'm very concerned, you know, as the head of trade, of the, of the, of the pressures that they are facing uh, in Afghanistan. We are seeking now to, uh, to bring people back into high threat IEDD operations. Uh, that have been out for some time. We are looking at more senior officers becoming involved in this. We've broadened our training and selection, uh, but it will take some time before uh, the, these measures can come into play. And what it does mean is it means the existing cohorts are going to be under pressure. Uh, I'm very concerned about that. In March, the special bravery demanded of the bomb disposal team was publicly recognised. I was there to receive Oz's George Cross citation. Captain Daniel Shepherd was awarded the George Medal and collecting his George Cross citation in person was Staff Sergeant Kim Hughes. I think it, it really does send a clear message that they are exceptional, exceptional operators and um, certainly they definitely went beyond the call of duty. Making this programme has confirmed what Oz told me, that the army was asking far too much of its bomb disposal experts in Afghanistan. I expect the MOD to keep its promise to me, to ensure better support for those who follow in their footsteps. Christina Schmidt there, and the MOD tells us that since her husband's death last October, it has doubled the number of high threat bomb disposal teams in Afghanistan. But since the interview he gave us, Colonel Bob Seddon has tendered his resignation as head of the Army's bomb squad. He cites as one of the reasons his concern over the welfare of high threat teams in Afghanistan. We'll be back on June the 7th to ask how our biggest football team was taken into the red by its American owners, whose business empire stands on a growing mountain of debt. Next year on BBC One and the BBC HD channel, the business of fashion with Joe Malone, living more high street dreams.